Great. We good to go? Good morning, and uh, welcome to the Church of the Incarnation. My name is Sam. I'm the associate pastor here, um, and it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Uh, as many of you will know from a newsletter that went out earlier this week, our senior pastor, Aubrey Spears, and his family, while they were down for Aubrey's mom's funeral in Texas and Louisiana, uh, were exposed to covid so uh, Aubrey and Janelle and at least one of the kids have, have shown symptoms. So that's why Aubrey's not here with us this morning. Um, and he wanted us to, to be sure to say that he misses you and wishes that he could be here with you. So please pray for the Spears family um, for a speedy recovery uh, this week. I should also tell you that we're recording this service on Friday afternoon because God willing... Assuming it doesn't rain, uh, we'll be out at the Cook's uh, house on Sunday morning doing an outdoor service. So um, assuming it hasn't rained, uh, that's where we'll be this morning. So please uh, be praying for that service if we've managed to gather out there and um, be sure to pray for uh, the, the eight people we have being baptized this morning. So I want to provide a minute now for us to silence our uh, mouths, settle our bodies, and offer up our whole hearts to God. So plant your feet flat on the floor. Rest your hands in your lap. Breathe deeply. And after several moments of silence, I'll invite you to stand and we'll begin. stand. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen.
Let's pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now all you who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, if you seek to live in love and charity with your neighbor and you intend to lead the new life, following from this day forward in God's holy ways, then draw near with faith and let's confess our sins before God kneeling together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, may he have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O oh, come, let us adore him. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation. Strong against my foes, and I will not be 
be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, we pray, the Spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who can do no good thing apart from you may by you be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's prepare now to hear the word of the Lord. Our first reading is from the prophet Haggai, chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. 
Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat and drew fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing, but from this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. New Testament reading comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, and all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, who you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, and believed in him, and sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, and the guarantee of our real Christ possession, real Christ possession, to the praise of his glory. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, Many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lindy, and Lily, and Wilson. Um, good morning. It's good to be with you all uh, again. If you've been with us over the past two weeks, then you'll know that we're in uh, a brief pit stop in our sermon series on James, and we're uh, tackling this little bitty Old Testament book of Haggai over the course of four weeks. So if you've got a Bible uh, nearby, uh, if you can remember where the last place you saw one is, go find it, dust it off, turn to the little book of Haggai. 
It's right at the end of the Old Testament, just three books before you get to the Gospel of Matthew. So that might help to follow along. In our Old Testament reading from Haggai chapter 2, God speaks to his people at a turning point in their walk with him. The scene takes place, verse 10 tells us, on December 18th, 520 B.C. That's three months to the day after the Jews resumed rebuilding the temple. So it's a significant time. But it's also a significant occasion. Verse 18 shows us that Haggai is delivering his prophecy at a public ceremony. It's a high-profile occasion marking the restoration of the temple. So why bother to underline these details about the setting of Haggai's next prophecy? The point is that the Jews' covenant relationship with God is being renewed. For years, they'd neglected to rebuild God's house. They'd shirked their covenant responsibilities, and so God inflicted 16 years of bad harvest on them, just like he threatened to do all the way back in Deuteronomy 28, verse 22, if Israel broke covenant with him. There's a big litany of curses that are going to fall on Israel if they break covenant. This is one of them. But, and here's the point of all the details about the setting, but from this day forward, God says, I will bless you. Why? Well, because on this day, the Jews have recommitted themselves to their covenant God. So the curse for their covenant breaking is lifted. So this morning, as uh, you're watching this from home, assuming we haven't been rained out, Eight people are going to be baptized. This is a huge occasion. This is a turning point. In eight people's covenant relationship with God. When one receives the sacrament of baptism by faith, she becomes a living stone that's being built up into the spiritual temple of the church. She becomes a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. She's engrafted into the covenant people of God. What's wonderful about this passage just happening to fall on the occasion of these baptisms is that it invites us to ask a simple but profound question. What does it mean to be God's covenant people? When God calls us into the church, into this spiritual temple, this habitation for his holiness, to what exactly is he calling us? In the first place, God is calling us to pursue personal holiness. Look at Haggai uh, chapter 2, verse 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this is Haggai talking, Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. And now here's the question that Haggai asked the priests. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it, does that food that's been touched become holy? So what's going on here? the Lord has sent Haggai to pose a question to the priests about the way that offerings work. Now, Jewish priests offered different kinds of sacrifices. Remember, some were burnt offerings, where everything is burned up, nothing is left over once the animal's been burned. In other types of sacrifices, leftover meat would be returned to the person who offered it, and then they would take it away, and they'd eat it at a a big celebration or a festivity. But in most sacrifices... Consecrated meat was given to the priests. That's the idea here. A priest has offered a sacrifice, 
And remember, the temple's in total dereliction, right? It's not standing, so they're going to take it away home. So they wrap up the leftover meat in their cloaks, and then they maybe get back home to the kitchen, and there's a stew on the stove, and there's a bit of onion out, maybe a bit of carrot out, or whatever they would have been eating at the time, and he, he brushes up against it. And Haggai wants to know, does the holiness of the meat transfer into something that the meat comes into contact with? If I bring home holy meat, do I get holy stew? Or, or, or even more, do, do I get holy onions? Now, don't miss what Haggai's up to. He's, he's not asking some arcane question about priestly rules. He's posing a probing question that all the Jews who have gathered there need to hear and wrestle with. This is the question. Can holiness be caught? Is it contagious? And it's to that deeper, more probing question that the priests answer a resounding, no, no, holiness is not contagious. Holiness cannot be caught. When God says to his people, therefore, in Leviticus chapter 11, be holy as I am holy. He's calling them to pursue personal holiness. Haggai reiterates that principle. Holiness doesn't bleed into your life just because you spend your time around people who pursue personal holiness. Your spouse's sanctity is not just going to rub off on you. Your friend's sanctity is not just going to rub off on you. Holiness doesn't seep into your heart just because you surround yourself with holy things. In fact, the Scottish minister George MacDonald said that there is nothing so deadening to the divine as an habitual dealing with the outsides of holy things. Holiness cannot be caught. It's not contagious. It must be pursued personally. And if you're thinking, and you're very right, that we're called to societal and corporate holiness as well. You're absolutely right. And guess where that begins? You. Your personal holiness. If you're a member of his covenant people, God is calling you to pursue personal holiness. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 shows us that absolutely no one is off the hook. Without holiness, says the author of Hebrews. No one will see the Lord. So the first question that the Holy Spirit's inviting us to ask this morning is, am I holy? I'm not asking if you're baptized. I'm not asking if you hunger for the Eucharist. I'm not asking if you've befriended holy people or married a holy person. I'm not asking if you enjoy the aesthetic of a formal and ritual kind of holiness. I can do all this and yet merely have occupied myself with the outsides of holy things. What I'm asking is, are you holy? Are you laboring to have the mind of Christ in all things? To think God's thoughts after him? Do you wake up in the middle of the night, and find yourself inwardly savoring the promises of God? Is it the promises of Scripture that jump most readily to mind when you're alone? Can you point to concrete ways in which the Bible has refined your prejudices? Are you resolved to put to death every sin in your life of which you're aware, and to obey every commandment to the fullest extent that you understand it, both in its negatives and in its positive implications. And to do so, not tomorrow, not one day when conditions improve and we're out from under the shadow of COVID-19, but today. Are you imitating Jesus 
his trust in his heavenly Father, his reliance upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit, his confidence in Holy Scripture, his perfect mixture of authority and meekness. Do you mourn over your sin when you see it? Do you find yourself indulging in the little, almost imperceptible beginnings of big sins? Or do you snuff those beginnings out the second that you mark their presence? Do you manifest the fruits of the Spirit? Would your family, your closest friends, look at you and say that they see in you evidence of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Do you fear God? Not the way a slave fears a master. I'm not asking you if you're cowed by God. I'm asking you if you bow before God. Do you fear him the way that a son or daughter fears their heavenly father as he rules in righteousness from his throne? God calls his covenant people to be holy as he is holy. For without holiness, personal, visible, God-glorifying holiness, no one will see the Lord. God's covenant people must pursue personal holiness. That's my first point this morning. Now, the pursuit of holiness is not an easy task. It's an uphill slog. Because as Bishop J.C. Ryle put it, true Christianity will cost a man his sins. And, and if we're honest, we love our sins. We identify with certain of our sins so intimately that we cannot disentangle them from our core identity. We 21st century Westerners have a difficult time disentangling our nature, which God created good, from the sin that clings so closely to it and adheres to it. And we worry, quite rightly, that Christianity is going to cost us things that we don't want to give up. The problem, the error here, is that we fear that in doing so, the gospel is going to cut through us like lie cuts through grease. And in the process, it's going to destroy not only our sin, which is the truth. We fear it's going to destroy our very selves as well. So we may be quietly, privately, secretly reluctant to pursue personal holiness. We may be deeply ambivalent about aligning our character with the character of God. We may be content with the mere outsides of holy things. And maybe this morning you recognize this reluctance in yourself. I do. Might it be that the most urgent obstacle in your walk with Christ is not the quality of the saints around you, nor the presence or lack thereof of spiritual things that edify you and nourish you? Might it be rather that the pursuit of personal holiness threatens some form of sin which has found a home in your heart of hearts? Can you sense a reluctance to pursue personal holiness? Any, any Christian who claims to have no such reluctance can have had only the smallest experience of the Christian life. If you've not gotten far enough in to experience that reluctance, you're no great saint. Reluctance to pursue holiness with one's whole heart, it's not a mark of spiritual weakness. It is an ongoing fact of the Romans chapter 7 nature of the Christian's spiritual battle. The pursuit is hard. It demands a lot. It demands everything. Which leads us to a second observation. As you're pursuing personal holiness... 
What, what else does it mean to be a member of the covenant people of God? It means, secondly, that God is calling you to root out a reluctant spirit. Look at verse 13. Haggai is still talking to the priests, and now he asks them a second question. If someone who's unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these people, anyone else, does it become unclean? Now, Haggai knows very well the answer to this. Numbers chapter 19, verse 11 says that anyone who touches a corpse becomes unclean. The impurity that one contracts by making contact with a corpse, it was so serious that it required a person to be put out of camp for a week before being ritually cleansed with the sprinkling of water. In fact, if Passover was going on, right, like the great big feast, They'd even have to miss the celebration of Passover. Numbers 19.22, several verses later, goes even further. It tells us that such uncleanness was contagious. Numbers 19, verse 22, And whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean. Sounds a little bit like COVID-19, doesn't it? And sure enough, the priests, once they've heard Haggai's question, they answer verse 13. Yeah, it does. It becomes unclean. Now again, don't miss what Haggai's doing. He's, he's not asking an arcane question about priestcraft. He's asking a probing question of universal significance. Can defilement be caught? And we learn that unlike holiness, it can. And here's the key point that Haggai's making. Defilement pollution, sin. It's more easily communicated than holiness. It is infinitely easier to slide downhill into sin than uphill into righteousness. Now Haggai goes on to make the big point, the big reveal, the mic drop moment that he's been setting himself up for with these two questions. Verse 14, so it is Now the Lord's talking. So it is with this people. Not, as God says in in other places in the prophets, my people, a me, my people. Not my people, this people. So it is with this people, with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands, what they offer there is unclean. What's Haggai saying? For years, Israel has been reluctant to rebuild the temple. They carried on making offerings, offering sacrifices, but uh, they'd in many ways obeyed the letter only of their covenant obligations to God. Meanwhile, their hearts were out of alignment with the covenant. They disobeyed God by neglecting the rebuilding of his temple, and that disobeying, that objective evidence right out there in the world that they did not love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. It defiled the offerings they made. It defiled their worship. In fact, it might even be that Haggai is comparing the ruined temple to a corpse, which has defiled their worship, their offerings, their sacrifices. When God calls us, into his covenant people, he's calling us to pursue our sanctification, our growth in holiness. But we're warned here about the dangers of a mere outward, formal holiness. Mere outward holiness, precisely because it flows from a reluctant spirit, actually defiles us. may even be fair to say that outward holiness flowing from a reluctant spirit is even worse than outright unbelief. I mean, think about what Haggai's been saying. Brushing up against an unbelieving Gentile, bumping into someone, that didn't defile anybody. But brushing up against a corpse did. And that's what the Lord is comparing his people to. It's what he's chastising them for. Outright unbelief the Lord seems to be saying, is preferable to two-faced, merely outward 
holiness. So remember that as, as you're pursuing personal holiness, God is also calling you to root out a reluctant spirit. Now, the application here is way more easily said than done. To root out a reluctant spirit, we've got to be people of daily prayer and daily communion with God because a reluctant spirit is not uprooted overnight. It's the Christian's daily work of putting to death our sinful habits and attitudes and laying open our hearts to the work of the Holy Spirit. To root out a reluctant spirit, we've got to fight a good fight and we've got to do it every day. Because we wake up every day in a spiritual battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, and it's vicious, and it's constant. And we fight it how? On our knees, by daily prayer, and daily communion with our God. So as you pray, ask God to to just do this. Ask him to uproot your reluctant spirit. Ask him as David does in Psalm 51, to uphold you with a willing spirit. Remember that God is calling you to root out a reluctant spirit. Now, we've said two critical things about what it means to be God's covenant people. God's calling us to pursue personal holiness and as we do so, to root out a reluctant spirit. But there's one critical element of this passage left that we've got to touch on. Because without it, an exhortation to holiness is incomplete and even misleading. That remaining element is the motivation. Verse 19. From this day on, the Lord says, I will bless you. As we pursue our own personal holiness, we know that we don't do it in our own strength. For God is calling us in the third place to a great motivation. Not to claim simply this temporal blessing of a harvest, but to claim every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Notice the way that God spurs his people on to obedience through Haggai. It's through the promise of blessing. Now, at first blush, Haggai is proclaiming this temporal blessing, right? Verses 18 and 19, God is going to provide a fruitful harvest after years of of skimpy harvests. But again, more is happening here. The harvest is a sign that points beyond itself. The point of the harvest is not the harvest. It's the point that the covenant relationship between God and his people has been renewed. God has been reconciled to his people. So it's not the harvest that we're interested in. The harvest points ahead to the one who will do the reconciling once and for all between God and his people, who will establish the new covenant. It points ahead to the coming of the Messiah, the thing that dazzles Haggai is not the fields white with harvest. It's the glorious face of Jesus Christ. So as we pursue personal holiness, as we root out a reluctant spirit, remember that these are not achievements that we seek in our own strength. Rather, we we strive for holiness with confidence that God's going to give it to us because he has given and has promise that he would give us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And when Wilson came up and read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14, we rehearsed all those spiritual blessings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And those spiritual blessings reach into our past and into our present and into our future. They reach into our past Ephesians 1, 4, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. God has not just called you to holiness. He has eternally and graciously determined to establish you in holiness. 
so we labor with confidence that our labor is not in vain. These spiritual blessings reach into our present experience. Ephesians 1, verse 7, In Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. We can fight the good fight. We can strive for holiness because we are assured that through the blood of Jesus we stand reconciled now with the God of heaven and earth. And these spiritual blessings reach thirdly into the future. Ephesians 1.10 we look forward to that day when God will unite in Christ all things in heaven and on earth. The God from whom we have been severed will be restored to him. Totally and finally. And we will know face to face the greatest love we've ever known. The promise that Haggai leaves ringing in our ears, is the promise that every one of you who is a member of God's covenant people can pursue the holiness to which God calls you, falter and stumble though you will, because in Christ you possess every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So you can take the risk of pursuing holiness. You can wake up and you can face the spiritual battle because your covenant God is working in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. To those of you who are not in Christ, who are not living stones being built up into a spiritual temple, these promises do not belong to you. If you deny Jesus the throne of your life, you can't expect to enjoy the blessings that he promises to those who endure in serving him faithfully. But listen to Haggai. Consider from this day forward that without these blessings, no one can attain the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The pursuit of holiness demands our blood and our sweat and our tears. We must struggle constantly for it, but it is not our work. It's God's work. And if you have no share in the blessings by which he does this work, then you cannot expect to find that in the end he will have done it in you. The Lord's mercy is great, even and especially to his weakest servants. But to those who refuse him, his severity is equally great. So I urge you, not tomorrow, not sometime, turn to the Lord with all of your heart. And to those of you who stand among God's covenant people, consider the blessings that he's lavished on you in Christ. Renew your resolve as living stones to be built up into a dwelling place for God. Pursue personal holiness. Root out a reluctant spirit and do so with the confidence that God has bound himself to ensure your success. Let's pray. Father, you called us out of darkness into your glorious light. Let us not languish any longer in the darkness. Give us grace never to rely on our status as your covenant people but to prove our pedigree by daring to be holy. And so may we bring glory and honor to your name. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, please stand and let's confess our faith now. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? 
We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. And if you're on your own, uh, find a way to greet someone now, maybe by text. Listen now to, uh, to what the Apostle Paul says to the church at Corinth. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. you, especially those of you who are at home, to stand or, or kneel at this point, and let's pray for the whole of Christ's church here on earth. Pray with me that, that our God would teach us by his holy word to offer prayers rightly give thanks for all people. And we pray particularly 
that he would inspire his whole church with the spirit of truth and unity and concord, granting that all who confess his holy name would agree in the truth of his word and live in unity and godly love. Pray that God would lead the nations of the world into the way of righteousness, guiding and directing our leaders, especially our president, so that they would impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and maintain true religion. Pray for all those who proclaim the gospel of the kingdom among the nations and locally. Pray especially for the Church of the Resurrection on Capitol Hill in D.C. That God would equip them to fulfill the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey all that the Lord Jesus has commanded. I ask your prayers that the Lord would comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, or any other kind of sickness. And I invite you to give thanks for all of the Lord's servants who've departed this life in his faith and fear. And I invite you to pray for grace that rejoicing in their fellowship, we may follow their good examples and become with them partakers of Christ's heavenly kingdom. invite you now to offer aloud any prayers or thanksgivings that the Lord may have laid on your hearts. Now let's conclude this uh, formal time of prayer by singing together the prayer that our Savior has taught us.
All right, well, uh, not very much in the way of announcements this morning. Really just two things. A reminder to be praying for the Spears family, and if there are particular ways that, um, that you would like to be caring for them, then you can reach out to Beth, our parish admin. You can find her information uh, at the end of the um, worship guide. And then secondly, hopefully, we've gotten to baptize a bunch of people this morning. Um, but if we haven't, and really, either way, please pray for them. Take time every day this week to thank God for them. And feel very free to reach out to me uh, or to Wilson or anybody else on staff if you would like to know, uh, if you'd like to know their names, we'd be easily able to send that list along so that you can pray for them. Right, well, let's stand now to sing our closing song. in your home, I invite you to uh, point to it now if you're joining us over the live stream. Otherwise, please join me. All our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit.